if you're just not even a front facing artist or producer, you can just monetize off of the music itself. Like, I just want to make money off of my music. I don't care about all of the other, you know, fan growth or Spotify number growth. I just want to make a sustainable living off of it. That's possible too. And that's why I advocate for Sync so much because it just gives the artist options, you know what I mean, on how they want to build a career in music. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Bram and Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you stream your podcast. Come you to the, from the intersection of creativity and commerce, the artists and the entrepreneurs. This is No Labels. And today I got somebody who represents that concept, doing something differently. No Labels. Welcome. Garage, what's good? What's up? What's up, man? How we feeling? <laughs> great, man. We feeling great. It's been a good day so far. You know what I'm saying? Like, now, I'm gonna say off the jump. This guy, he's made some money doing what he does. He's brought in over two hundred thousand dollars just from sync alone, right? Now we're gonna get into that and what that means and what that looks like, but. He also could have played basketball. I don't know. He might have low-key got his money from basketball. <laughs> we ran into him at the recording academy party, and I kept looking up, and, and, and it didn't stop. You know what I mean? What are you yeah. like? Um, yeah, it's different when you get in real life, man. These little Instagrams and, you know, stories don't show the, you know what I mean? You don't get a good. <laughs> yeah, man. But, yeah, man, it's it's, it's cool, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here, man. Um. I, off rip, I love the title of this podcast, No Labels Necessary, uh, which I know you guys are going to get to my story, but, you know, I'm, I'm a big uh, indie indie advocate, indie producers, indie artists. Um, I'm an indie myself, formerly signed to a label, but um, I'm sure we'll get there. But yeah, man, I'm excited to talk about it. Man, man, we, we're definitely going to get there. I want to start with delving into the sync side of things, because I sure. know that a lot of people don't start there, right? So I just want to get straight into the sauce of like what's the what brought you into the sync world? Yeah, man. So um I alluded to it a little a little earlier. Um I first found out about and I didn't know it was called sync at the time, but during the time when I was signed to the label that I mentioned, um I signed around 2014 and early on, you know, with, with my time there, the label I had, uh, it was the first EP that I dropped on the label and one of the songs called the interest of ESPN. And I, it was one of those things where we just, we didn't know really how it happened outside of somebody from that side of the industry was just following, uh, the label. They reached out, thought one of my songs would be a good fit. Uh, um, and then, you know, probably like a couple of weeks later, it was on ESPN's first take, which is ironically, I, I hadn't even heard of first take before I knew of ESPN, obviously, but from that like point on, like for me, it just kind of sowed a seed of like, how do I do <clears throat> like more of this? Because it's just, for me, it's just like, it's a little old me, you know what I mean? And I just made this music in my bedroom, just signed to a label and now a brand like ESPN wants to use my music and ends up using it. And I'm seeing my name on like the lower thirds, you know what I mean? When they're running the segment and all this. So, so many thoughts were running through my head and I just got hooked. And so from that point on, it was just trying to figure out how to do more of that. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Now, was it just the visibility and what you saw there that excited you or did the money excite you as well or you're signed to a label right we might have to get into something maybe you, you didn't even really see the money like what was that yeah yeah that's a good question because like when that one started it wasn't like a, a crazy fee i mean it was probably less than two thousand dollars of that um i can't even remember how much of that was my portion um but it was just one of those things where being a young artist because i you had to like I, you wouldn't have known this, but I didn't have any ambitions to be doing music in the capacity that I'm doing it now. Like my background is in uh, like visual arts and branding. Like that's what my degree is in. Like I moved from Richmond, Virginia down to Orlando, Florida is where I'm at now. 
uh, for school. And I went to full so I got my bachelor's degree in digital arts and design. And so that's the track I was on. Music was just like a hobby. It was a form of like ministry. It was community. Um, one thing I did mention, the label that I was signed to was a Christian hip hop label. So like my faith and all that kind of stuff was really deeply integrated with what I was doing. But um, yeah, the label thing just kind of happened. And actually it happened because of my design. Like they they were looking for a graphic designer for like some t-shirt merch designs for one of the artists that turned to me doing like, you know, uh, album cover art. And then it evolved into me just being their art director for everything for the label. Then they found out that I did music and that's how that whole conversation happened. Um, so I had no like game plan for where I am now. And so I guess like guys, it's funny like that. I just end up here and this is all I do you know, what I mean, for a living. Uh, so early on, it was just the, the fact that my music was just seen on such a large platform in a way that I thought that was reserved for like other people, you know what I mean? Like other artists that maybe were more established or whatever. And um, yeah, man, so it, it was more of that. It, was, it just gave me a, a good bit of validation um and also like i can get paid to do it as well so yeah well let, let me ask you this because you, you said this was 2014 right you know? yeah, yeah so 2014 like streaming wasn't as crazy yet so you know i know today if an artist were to get a sync placement they probably would judge the impact based on you know streams going up or followers or things like that so what was the if, if the money wasn't crazy like what was the visible impact that you were seeing after it happened so and it's one of those things I wish I probably would have paid attention more. I couldn't tell you, like I couldn't qualify the impact beyond like some other tangible metrics. I just know I saw my my song on TV. I know I got paid some money for it and I know it's ESPN. You know what I mean? And that was enough for me to kind of get like to get started on this thing. Now, as I grew and as I evolved, like and, and have more of a, a kind of a business focus on it. Uh, those things happen, like metrics might look a little different because um, I've had songs that, you know, solely because of licensing, you know, have gotten, you know, two, three thousand. Actually, like one of so I have a, a couple of other artist projects that I do music on. They're not just Derage. I have another artist project called Sunny O and it's um, a project that kind of happened on accident. It's like a, a funk, new age funk. R&B, all R&B, hip hop kind of fusion thing um, that we do. And our top song is like close to a million. And like, and this is this is just off of the strength of like um, us having it in the right hands of uh, certain licensing agencies. And when we pushed this project originally, like we didn't have a crazy like marketing plan behind it. Like we did a photo shoot, you know, got a you know decent brand popping. Put it out to my audience because I had, a, you know, the largest audience on my garage brand. Just let them know, like, hey, I'm doing this other thing called Sunny O. And it's it's streaming over a million or close to a million just on Spotify. But a good majority of that is just because the music is available for licensing. And it's a good song. But, you know, it's just like we get paid off of it. Like that one song, like it's gotten a, it's got a ton of micro licenses, but it also got like a Call of Duty placement. And if you hear the song, it sounds like you would never think this song i'm singing like falsetto and it's like kind of groovy and it's like i call it a mobile placement so it's super weird um so to your like to your question stuff like that can happen as far as it can increase your streams but, but also too if you're just not even a front-facing artist or producer you can just monetize off of the music itself without you know like if that's your only metric and that's your goal is just like i just want to make money off of my music I don't care about all of the other, you know, fan growth or, you know, Spotify number growth. I just want to make a sustainable living off of it. That's possible too. And that's why I advocate for sync so much because it just gives the artists options, you know what I mean? On how they want to build a career in music. Yeah. Yeah. You just use a term too. I've, I've never heard before micro placement, but it makes me feel like, you know, there must be levels to the world of like sync placements. So can you talk about that? Like micro placements and then kind of what goes beyond these different types of placements yeah so um there's a couple of different segments i always like to uh talk about of where your music can kind of live um there are you know obviously we know uh tv film and that could be like scripted unscripted tv you know think um 
you know, Euphoria or You or Atlanta, like that's all scripted, unscripted, being like reality TV shows, Perfect Match, um, Survivor, all that kind of stuff. Um, we have digital promos, um, digital online promos and also um, TV promos. We have uh, commercials and advertising. Um, there's trailers. There's uh, podcast licensed music. Um, I think what else? And I mentioned the the micro licensing side of it, and that's more like YouTube content creators, uh, you know, certain nonprofits, um, uh, just content creators in general that have a visual component to it. Like if they're looking to like monetize like on platforms like YouTube, then they need a license to be able to do so or get like copyright strikes or their videos muted or like Twitch and all that other kind of stuff. Um, we're actually in a situation now where uh, one of our songs, uh, for some reason, somebody else ended up claiming copyright on it. We we're trying to figure out how all this happened. But long story short, the platform that's um, licensing it, which is Artlist, is another company that artists can give their music to. And Artlist will provide that music to their you know massive amount of subscribers to use um, you know, without any penalty and be able to license it legally. Uh, but one of their users got their video muted because there was a copyright claim on it because you know we own the copyright even though we didn't do it somebody else owned it so we're in a in a situation trying to figure it out but i just use that as an example that that's a thing like you're you put a video up you don't own the music like it, you know, like you, uh, your audio can get muted or get you know copyright short taken down or whatever whatever um and there's a few other segments i'm i'm I, i'm not recalling right now but there's a lot of different ways that you can oh custom music like custom bespoke music like um you think of like children's animations or something like that like if there's a really hyper specific song talking about like you know think door to explore you know talking about where's the mountain you know what i mean like that's a custom song that has to get licensed theme songs also get licensed um so yeah there's a lot of different ways that your music can get used in this space but again, like to to like what you are saying, the awareness is not there as far as how any artist or producer can really leverage their music uh, expertise or knowledge for licensing with brands. It seems like the only way to monetize your music is touring, your streams, is uh, brand partnerships, it's uh, merch. I don't know if I already said that, but. And I always say, like, if, if sync is on the list at all, it's usually last, but usually it's not even on the list. You know what I mean? It's, and it's really powerful as far as fueling and funding in an artist's career and also even giving more exposure to an artist's career, like even social validation and social equity. You know what I mean? Because I can't tell you how many looks I get um, just because, like, I've had a Wakanda placement or I've had, like, you know, Timo or Peloton placement. It's just like I'm associated with these major brands. And so that just gives me a certain level of um a, a certain seat at the table, if you will. You know what I mean? Yeah. Wait, so yeah. you're saying just because, right, you're associated and I see that you're in this big thing, now they're like, oh, well, that's an artist that we want to reach out to because obviously this company trusted them and this guy. Yeah. It's almost like social social proof or almost like clout within that space, basically. Yeah, right? man. Yeah, it's, it's just it's like it's social equity and sense. like you can leverage that. Um, and, and, and it's one of those things. I mean, you kind of have to know how to navigate conversations with, you know, people on that side. But I do know it puts you in more conversations and, and gets you access to um, conversations or opportunities that, you know, you might not just because. Oh, I see this person got, you know, this placement or this placement. Like as an artist, it seems like they're doing something right because these big brands are wanting to use their music. Um, so maybe there's a story there, maybe there's something more there. And right. you know, it's it's to be found out if there is, but again, it just people just care about optics, you know what I mean? Like if it look like it's popping, then let me find out if it is and it'll get validated, but at least where the opportunity didn't exist like it just becomes a little bit more uh, substantive because like you know they got they're they're aligned with this particular brand i mean you know that as a as a um as a business owner like your network can really really help like propel you into different spaces just because you're aligned with the right people and so i just think it's the same thing with leveraging brand uh awareness and placements to kind of give you a little bit more exposure and 
um, opportunities to just offer those type of looks. Yeah, man, even knowing how corporations work or a lot of these companies at large, it makes a lot of sense because we get so cut off in the music space, right? Us and a lot of the people who follow us. And we think of things in the context of the music ladder and how this industry sees other artists. But the value looks completely different in the things they measure outside of music. Like there's a guy, uh, yeah. Kat, shout out to him, he got like 100K from Spanx because yeah. he, whatever. Even if someone within music and closer to the music industry um, was involved, they probably, one, wouldn't have thrown that number out. Two, would have like tried to finesse it and get somebody else to create it. Like there's a completely different way of judging it, right? Yeah. So knowing that, and if I'm further away from music, I probably see yet again, like, oh, Daraj, he's worked with, like he, he was in the Wakanda project. He did this company, this company. I'm actually also using that, not just to create my own interest, but to say, hey, yo, Corey, this guy, he's been on, you know, in these projects. So it's like a trustworthiness that I could communicate right. to my people involved, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I always say like businesses do business with um the the less risky option. Um, and so and also too, like businesses work with those they trust and like. And so if I'm able to um and and, and again, like it just depends on what you're trying to do in your music career because um, if I'm trying to court certain relationships, um, and that's the thing, like for me, just like some of my music was one thing. And so I got a lot of, you know, dope looks from that. And also like we were heavy on Clubhouse at one point and we started to offer education to artists. And that's another validation because we, again, that social proof of, we know what we're talking about. And also even, even during that process, we were able to get like others, music supervisors from like CBS or Netflix or um cobalt or um what else like um fox you know what i mean like they'll they came in and talked to our community and stuff like that and just again being aligned with different people like we were able to start like bringing in more you know um noteworthy guests and stuff like that and so now there's a compounded side of it where i'm i know how to license my music but i also know what i'm talking about i know how to help other people license their music and so now, like, like, I remember when we were having talks with, um, it was a, a, I'll say it was a, one of the larger uh, streaming platforms. I was talking to one of their executives. And even when we were just starting our course out, uh, they were asking how, like, them as a company could be even deeper involved with what we have going on. We were just starting out. But it was because we had, like, and I and I purposely kind of reserved some of the um, involve me because I wanted us to kind of get a strong foundation before we bring such a big company in to kind of align with on some things. Um, I'm just one of those ones where I like to scale like in a healthy way and not like oversell or undersell or whatever. It's just like, hey, we know that's there. Let's, you know, maybe revisit the conversation later. But it just goes to show like the perception of a thing um, is 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 a thing. <laughs> you know what I mean, when it comes to business building, um, and you want to be ready for those opportunities when they come. But uh, but just because of some of those uh, like peripheral or adjacent uh, relationships that we've been, been been able to build, it just helps position us in different ways. And I just use that as an example for any artist, like like being able to create as much leverage as you can, you know, just helps you when you get into these different rooms and different doors and also being clear on what you want. Um, so that's why I say like, it's just another thing because, because right now for indie, like for, for indies or, you know, artists that are putting stuff out, their leverage is going to be their fan base or their numbers. You know what I mean? It seems like in most cases, like if you got a, a really strong fan base and you can prove that, like based off of your, you know, engagement numbers, all that kind of stuff, then that gets, a, you know, brands, you know, bigger entities or partnerships that, or you can start courting those type of opportunities or, if you're just doing numbers, you know what I mean? Like on Spotify, cause it's all public to people. Like that's just like, all it is is leverage. You know what I mean? For other things, other companies I want to bring you into. But like for me, like when I, when, when I started focusing on licensing, the amount of licenses and placements that I was getting and showcasing on my social media started to become like the, 
uh, the leverage and the social proof for people to say like, yo, he just keep getting all these placements. He align with these, you know, big brands and yada, yada, like on the fan side and also on the, the buyer client side to say like, all right, he's, you know, he's making noise and the music is good. You know what I mean? And so, yeah. So it's, it's just, it's leverage, you know what I mean? Like leverage and figuring out how you can create that for yourself as an artist. Um, I just feel like will propel and is, is, is probably the most useful, um, piece in your arsenal like yeah i would say <laughs> so some artists and managers are just waiting for lucky moments when the ones who are killing it have systems to consistently take artists to another level over and over again and if you want to see what that looks like we just did a collab where we not only show the system that we use that's resulted in billboard hits some of the biggest viral moments on tiktok instagram and youtube but also we got jr mckee to break down how he took an artist from zero to one of the biggest hit songs of 2022 and getting a grammy in january of 2023 this is recent stuff not old tactics if you want to check it out go to www dot brandmannetwork.com slash grammy don't forget the www or it won't work because jr gets into the details of looking at the data decisions that got made how much content got created and how they adjusted the content over time for different parts of the campaign this is real behind the curtains type of stuff so again go to www.brandmannetwork.com slash grammy if you want to check this out and apply it to yourself back to the video I want to get into what artists can do before that i just got reminded you said it was probably maybe two months ago now i can't remember the exact timeline but it was recently i walked upstairs to have a conversation with my lady she paused the tv and when you pause the tv now it's this feature where we can see like the actors in it and apparently shows the music. And I saw Daraj up there. And I hadn't told you that. I, I forgot about that. That's crazy. <laughs> you want to guess what show it was? <laughs> what, it was recent? It was pretty recent. But, uh -oh. you know, things are, you know, people watch old stuff these days, you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to think of some of the recent stuff or some of it. It was a, it was a streaming platform, I'm assuming. This is how y'all know this guy actually does this, right? He came. <laughs> well, there's multiple <laughs> options that it could be. Because yeah. we got like one on show. Uh, what's the uh, it's show Your Honor with um, Brian Cranston? That's one we got recently. I'm going um, to you. For, like Disney. So that <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 I'm, I'm curious, like, which one was it? It was Harlem, I believe. All, I, all right. Funny story about this, bro. Funny story. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I didn't even know uh, we had landed that spot. Like, I had somebody in my DM saying, like, yo, I love that song that was in Harlem and this season, this episode. They told me, like, the season, the episode. I was like, I didn't even know one of our songs was in there. And I went and sure enough, one of our songs is in there. But that's a thing, like, when I'm working with certain agencies, sometimes they'll approve a license and they'll they'll approve, like, a quote request for it a usage will happen before the the final paperwork is signed and we're notified and stuff like that. Uh, but that's a thing that happens sometimes. It's like, they'll end up using um, our song and it'll be even before some of the final paperwork is done, which is so odd to me, but that's just like the nature of the business. And I had no clue. And I looked on it, I was like, dang, I got, you know, another placement, but, but that's one of the things like it's powerful the different strategies that you could use in this space because again like I, I, when i talk about it to my students it's like every song ends up being like a piece of real estate you know what i mean that you can like lease out to somebody and as long as i own that piece of real estate i can keep you know license it because that i think that particular song you're talking about is either um feeling good or like color me crazy is one of those songs um i think that we did because i remember that particular spot but like those two songs, we actually got a, a, a quite a few licenses just within this first quarter of the year. Um, so yeah, man, it's uh, it's it's, it's dope. I, I love what we do. So. <laughs> that, that, that's really interesting to me. I hadn't heard that before that they'll like approve a song before you're even aware. In some cases, is that because when it comes to some such situ situations, it's like time sensitive because we got to like get it. Approved? Yeah. 
I've yeah, I've had and sometimes it's relationship based too, because like I work with certain supervisors and they'll need like a quick turnaround, like they're just trying to fill a spot and they just know like once they get a quote request of they'll send a quote request like, hey, this is what we're looking for. Can you approve it at this budget at these terms? Um, and if we give them a yes, then typically they'll just run it and then they'll come back to get a formal license agreement and everything. Um, and as an artist, like if someone's coming directly to me, I can approve that. Or if I'm working with an agency, um, they can approve it on, my, on our behalf. And sometimes they just notify us, you know, a little later. Uh, certain agencies will have to like uh, give approval. There's other agencies where they'll just like, they'll let us know like, hey, we got this particular um, tentative placement. Are you guys cool with these terms? Yada, yada, yada. And we'll say yes and they'll move. Some other companies like, it's just kind of built in that they'll approve on like on our behalf without, you know, our yes or no. And so you just kind of got to know those different arrangements. But yeah. Yeah. So what exactly should an artist do if they want to get in position to be attractive for placements? Yeah. Um, so I would I always tell artists. It's partly why we we started the course that we did and why we were on Clubhouse so heavy, Clubhouse so heavy um, like two years ago. But I would I would really encourage artists one to like if if sync licensing is just a new term for you, like just scour the internet to understand just what it actually is and what it means. And 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 simply put, it's just it like whenever your music is being used for visual media, they need permission. Um, to use your music or your music or whoever are who are the copyright owners of the song. Um, and what they need is called a synchronization license because your music is being synchronized to motion picture and they need a license, a.k.a. permission to use it. So that's in simplest terms, that's all it is. Um, you know, the details of it look different, you know, per license agreement, all that kind of stuff. But that's just what it is. Um, but as far as just positioning yourself and I, I just feel like indie artists have a really great uh, advantage because um, one, if artists are creating everything original uh, from the ground up um, and you all like haven't signed over any of those rights to any like larger organizations, it makes you um, advantageous if you know, understand, you know, you got all your ducks in a row on the business side because it can make you potentially like a one stop clearance, which just means if 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 you know Netflix is looking to use your music and they come to you like as the artist direct um, directly and and it could be like um, you know say it's a few of you all on one track you know you can you know appoint one person to make you know decisions on behalf of everybody or approvals of, on behalf of everybody and that person will become like uh, a one stop you know, clearance authority for the placement which the reason why it's important because it just makes uh, a license happen way quicker because there's less people involved to kind of muddy and slow down the process. Um, you know, when brands are wanting to license like a major artist, they have to go through like the label and the publisher and whoever uh, has, you know, vested stake in that because uh, there could be multiple artists working on one song and each artist has their own individual publishing company and their own, you know, separate stake. Um, and then also on the master side, like somebody could have, you know, master control over, you know, somebody's copyright interest. And so like supervisors or, you know, studios have to go through all of these individuals and get a yes from everybody. Um, and when you're dealing with majors, like they're trying to drive the price point usually, you know, as high as they can to be able to, you know, cover, you know, their overhead and all that other kind of stuff. Um, so as an indie artist, if you're able to give all of that clearance, um, directly, it just makes their job way easier and a little bit more advantageous. And as you grow, like you can begin to learn a little bit more about the, uh, different terms and deal types and, um, uh, market rate for different types of placements, um, or, and, or just aligning with a licensing agency who can act as your one stop to be able to kind of do some of that stuff for you, which, you know, makes it even more advantageous. Um, so that's why it's like, it's, 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 it's really powerful and it gives you a lot of options. 
Um, but as far as just preparation, I would say make sure like whenever you're working with uh, your collaborators, like, you know, you all are signing split sheet agreements, like, you know, who owns what parts of the, the, the master and the publishing or if you are splitting it evenly, like making sure that gets documented. Um, also, you want to make sure like as you're creating your music, you're not, you know, using unclear samples or like, you know, just taking out of the box um stems for uh splice so making sure that you know all your music is original like just trying to you know break break it down to the simplest form uh, and because like this is a i always tell people like this is a like a legal transaction and so if you're licensing your music you're giving them the assurances that like you're giving them assurances that this is like available and and, and safe to use because let them find out that a um you know you told them it was one stop or you gave them permission to use your music um but you forgot that one you know person that has like five percent of the song or something like that and they find out that yo you know my song got used and i didn't get i didn't get you know my permission wasn't given like technically they have grounds to like you know pursue legal action for using their music without their permission even though um it was given but it shouldn't have never been given but you gave the assurances and so now it kind of creates more of a dynamic and that's the easy way um for whoever you know uh approach you to use your music like they'll never do it again like if a supervisor is looking to use your music and you create that type of hassle for them they're like yeah now nah, i'm cool and and reason two is because music is usually the last part of a production you know what i mean like they've already gone through all of the scripting like directing the filming the editing and now they're at the last phase and usually music gets the shortest timeline you know part of it and then it starts to become like you know they needed music yesterday and clearance of yesterday and so if at the very last stage they start having complications and it shows up later on down the line it just messes like it's just a lot of ramifications for you feel me yeah, been there, been there. <laughs> you ever fumbled the opportunity with one of these situations earlier on? If so, like, how'd you do it? Um, yeah, I've, I've definitely had some uh, missteps, like just doing outreach, like sending too many emails out, and I mess around and put the wrong name, like in the in the uh, hey, you know, Amanda, and it's really supposed to be directed to you know, Jacqueline, you know what I mean? It's just like, I'm not, so that kind of stuff, but I've, I've done stuff like that. And, um, I'm trying to think I've had situations where, um, contractually I was only allowed to have these particular batches of songs, uh, with this one agency that I gave and then, um, didn't realize that I could, cause there's different types of agreements. You can have exclusive or non-exclusive, um, and I've given given exclusive songs to another agency, just unaware that that was the type of arrangement. Um, so that's happened before. Um, I'm trying to think of some other case scenarios, but yeah, I mean, this happens, you know what I mean? But I do think being as prepared going into it and just like understanding like where and how severe the you know, like offense is or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, that's helpful because a lot of the stuff like I can, you know, you can pivot well from. And if you just, you know, nice person and just, you know, play dumb sometimes, like it can, it can help. But there's certain things where it's just like you just really want to have this in order um before you get in, into there. Like stuff's gonna happen, but but yeah. That makes sense because I mean, yeah, on that side, you aren't necessarily dealing with fans as much, but it sounds like the ramifications of messing up because it's more person to person uh it yeah serious outcomes because i'm sure these music su supervisors also know each other some of them at least right so like oh yeah it's it's a it's a big community but it's small at the same time so where to get around <laughs> like in the same way like if you're killing it where to get around and also too if you're a little like you know what i mean like stay clear of this person that that can get around too yeah so yeah, it definitely sounds like it's important to know the right moves and be prepared and whatever that looks like, uh, which I mean, you, you've given some of those notes, but before we even get too far away from it, Corey, you got to explain the little situation you had. I, 
I need to see what happened, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> this was a minute ago. It's probably like seven, eight years ago at this point. But I, I was managing um, a rapper, and I got an email one day from Adidas, and they wanted to use one of his songs for a campaign. And so, you know, to the point you made about all parties involved got to kind of be down. I, I don't remember the exact agreement, but I think it was like each person would be be, be paid like 8K, right? So it was 8K for the artist I managed, 8K for the feature artist, and then 8K for the producer. And the feature artist felt like he should get more money. Like he's like, man, I think we should fight for like 10K, like 15K. And we're like, nah, man, you know what I'm saying? 8K is cool. We wasn't. <laughs> and yeah, he wouldn't budge on it. Like he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't budge on it. Um, we didn't get the placement because, like you said, like every we, that's when we learned, like yo, all parties involved have to be have to be cool with it, right? Like in one person, yeah, involved, man. Um, then then the whole thing doesn't go through. And I was telling Sean what was crazy about it is that maybe around the like the second time he didn't budge, and like we were trying to convince him and everything, he didn't budge. The lady I was talking to was like, yeah, it's such a shame, you know, like Adidas was planning to spend like. Half a million dollars on this ad campaign, running it for like a year and a half, two years. I'm like, man, it's crazy, but we missed out on a half a million dollar Adidas marketing op because this other artist wanted like three thousand more dollars. You know what I'm saying? Which is yeah. a lot. We would have made that back if we had made the play. You know, especially thinking about back then. You know, and, and kind of how it would have looked. So now I think about that shit like once a week. You know. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that's real. I do you want better? So I got a um a collaborator of mine that I do. Uh, a lot of work with and uh, he's been doing it way longer than I have but he was telling me about um the company that he's with and they you know they've seen like you know multiple six figure placements and stuff like that and they had a like a you know it, it might have been like 150 a side which means like it's 150 for the publishing and 150 for the master so it's like 300k all in or something like that um and the uh company i think it was the publisher he was with um had the authority and clearances to give a yes you know what i mean on you know for their 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 stake and um i forget the reason why but they didn't and, like they walked away from like uh like a six figure placement type stuff bro like it, it, it's crazy you know what i mean so i mean it, it happens but it's, it's and that's why I, i'm 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 pro indie, you know, to be able to kind of have some of those authorities, but I'm also pro like get all your stuff together, like up front. So that when the opportunities come, you're ready to just pull the trigger, keep it moving. You know what I mean? But I feel you, bro. <laughs> yeah, even, even now thinking back on it, right? Like, I wonder if like, what, I, what could have I, I have done differently? Cause at that time I was pretty new to the music industry. So I didn't have, you know, stories and expertise to pull from to help. Right. Out. I couldn't really give him a projection of what what happened because I've never seen it before. So with you kind of haven't been in these situations before, like when you run into a situation like that, what does the process look like for you? Like, what are you doing to try to, I guess, persuade the other side, you know? Yeah, man. Um, in those situations, man, it's I mean, if somebody is really like hard pressed on just like like they're just standing firm on this is what I think we should get. I mean, I would tr really try to like get through the thought process of it um, and really understand why. And cause maybe like I, I would, I would like understand it more. Maybe they just had, you know, more understanding of the market, you know what I mean? Like what is actually commanding and is, is it justifiable? But, you know, sometimes like there's times where I've taken, um, lower fees like sync fees upfront fees on a, a placement knowing that like we could be getting more for this but sometimes it's just like it, it gets your foot in the door to like you know build relationship with this person on the other side to court more business you know what i mean um and so it doesn't all you don't always have to play hardball on the first one unless it's just like you know you're just completely getting taken advantage of or something like that which usually as, as far as i've seen like most supervisors or agencies when they're presenting a budget like they're either trying to like they're trying to find the most money for like the artists and also be within budget for their you know for the production um but uh but yeah it's it's tough like if somebody's just unrelenting and not going to move then it's just one of those things where like at that point you just might want to find you know another collaborator <laughs> because if they if they're going to be that difficult you know what i mean moving forward 
then it's just not going to be sustainable because uh, you're going to end up, you know, having more of a headache uh, down the line. But but one other little hack too, when it comes to just negotiations in general, I like having like agencies also represent us because their job is just to understand and know the market, and they're having these conversations all the time, and so they can actually be a good like free advisory to understand like what should this be. And you can let them know, like, hey, I would love to get see this much for it. Is that a reasonable? Is that unreasonable? And they can kind of help walk you through whether it maybe is or isn't. You know what I mean? And they can even like even if you want to push more, they can still push more if you tell them, um, even if they don't advise it. But um, and also, too, you can have um, like I have arrangements with certain agencies where as an independent artist, sometimes I'll court my own direct deals. And if I don't want to do the paperwork for it or even negotiate like terms, I can have an agency partner that I work with step in to administrate the whole deal at a lower commission. You know what I mean? And so that's another way. And I've done that. And there's been situations where they end up finding more money and raising the fee because they just know what the value of the song is more than I might at the time. Um, but they're also doing it at a lower commission. So, you know, it's it's. it's it's dope. It's, it's different ways you can maneuver through it, but um, but yeah, to answer your question, like man, if you got people that's just stuck and it's just hard, like you know what I mean, like it's 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 hard, you know, if they're not listening to reason, you know what I mean. I was on different pages, like at that point, like I don't work with people who just make it difficult, you know what I mean, to move. Like they just have to understand and just be on the same page. Not that they don't have a voice or anything like that. We all make collective decisions, but we know why why we're doing this and what we're doing. You know what I mean. Yeah, well, and th this is something that I thought after. I just more so want to know if this is can be done or is ethical or not. Like, could we have just remade the song without the other artists and then resubmitted that? Like I said, I thought about this. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, depends <laughs> on on what they have on the original ownership. Like, if they just you know performed on the master and like they're just like playing keys or whatever, whatever um then you just remake the master and cut them out you know what i mean but if they were a part of the publishing side like the composition and like wrote lyrics or were responsible for the melodies that made up the master it would be tough like on the publishing side to cut them out because they were foundational in making the master because you wouldn't have the master without their song structure um unless you just completely redid the music or whatever part they did um it's hard to kind of quantify it but but I've I, actually I've seen that happen too, where um, somebody did that. Like it was a, it was a tough partnership, and they were trying to like circumvent one particular artist because they were being or actually they didn't want to move forward, and they were making it difficult just for the whole team. And one of the artists took the song and just made a whole new version on the master, and ended up like you know um, I forget I forget the arrangement, but that's happened before where they were able to like just create something new. And still make money off it, and they were mad because they ended up getting money. But they all could have ended up getting money. They just didn't want to play ball. So, yeah, I mean, time machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fact. I mean, it's so hard for me to understand why people would not say okay outside of just severely misunderstanding the market. Because when I look at streaming, and then I look at sync, right? When Bro. you have opportunity is nothing like it because you got one right you know I, i've seen 5k 10k 15k which i know is some of the lower end deals right but let's just say we're talking about 5k instead of getting a million streams a little bit over a million streams to get that 5k you got it off right off the bat right, right. secondly Corey talks about a 500k adidas budget right whatever they're putting it in is something they're going to market so they're going to create more visibility for your song. Right. <laughs> hey, for somebody to market your song. It's like if people came to us, it, it, it was it's, it's the reverse. It was like, hey, man, we want to give you some money so we can market your song. Like, uh, right. like, <laughs> oh, my, right. like offer to refuse to me because now you're going to get some Shazam, Shazams and things like yeah. that. Your record could still pop just off of that. And you get all the streaming cut to yourself. Like, so I don't understand why people... I think the only the only time I see it where it makes more sense um, or not even say it makes more sense where like people will kind of deny a sync 
typically they might be just a little further along in their career where and again like i'm talking like either and i'm talking on both sides like artists who just prioritize and do a lot of stuff and sing and get a lot of licenses made a career out of it like at, at a certain threshold they might have enough passive income coming through and they know the market enough and they want to establish their value and set a precedence a bit more where it's just like you know this is my rate and this is what i value that if you can't make it like meet it then it's cool you know what i mean but we just want to move forward on it i just see that more like the top 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 tier um and then on the mainstream side if you're like you know freaking bruno mars or something like that or you know meg the stallion you're giving probably that brand more leverage you know what i mean or you know awareness than i'm um, or it could be you know equal but at the same time like those are the scenarios where i see it most but for the majority of ndrs like i was i saw um thing on instagram where i can't remember it was if there was a it was like a, a pyramid where somebody's talking through just how many um the list of the the play count on the amount of songs uh, and users that were uploaded on like spotify or something like that awesome. and the vast majority of it like got like like less than a thousand plays or something like that. it was something crazy really? um yeah <laughs> man so i'm just like if you like if you're not making any money off the music already then it kind of doesn't make sense to approve a license you know what i mean especially if it's like eight thousand dollars like you got you know how many streams you would have to do to get eight thousand dollars on just your portion you know what i mean like we, we talking about gross <laughs> like when we talk about those spotify numbers if you got other collaborators that 5k gonna get split however many ways you got you know how many people on a song but for what you were saying it seemed like every person was getting 8k so effectively, it's just like what thirty two thousand dollars or whatever the math works out to. That is the entire fee. You know what I mean? So that's like crazy um, for one song, and they're marketing it, and they're getting exposure. Like it's yeah, it's a no brainer to me. But you know, some people just have a different mindset, and um, yeah, no, that's that's the thing, man. It'll be a no brainer, but the person don't have a brain, so you're like, oh, this is real. <laughs> Unless you like, uh, you know, like Jay Z or something like that. Jay Z just think different. He might turn down some stuff and just really have a particular. But he he probably got like twenty steps ahead and why he's doing it. Most artists don't do that. So it's just like most artists are like let me get his bag real quick and just leverage that and scale up. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I mean, I guess a couple other things that I want to get into while we're on this in particular is one. You you've done video games, TV shows. Um, have, what are all the formats that you've been on so far? Yeah, so um, done trailers, um, done commercials, uh, TV promos, uh, video game trailers. Been in video game, uh, in TV shows, in show. Um, we've. I'm trying to think if we've had like a um like the opening scene you know what i mean of a of a spot which is it's like the the opening titles and the end credits are like a thing like in in licensing um podcasts about my, my music license podcast micro sync space um pretty much kind of like all the ones that i mentioned before like custom music like i've done really specific songs for um for certain spots so yeah, I've written like children's songs and stuff like that before. Um, yeah, man, I'm trying to think of anything else, but that's that's kind of the the, the majority of it. What's your favorite type of thing to get in? Trailers and ads, trailers and ads, which trailers are kind of like a, a form of advertising. But I think one because my musical interest is just it just leans more there is kind of bigger is dynamic like i do a lot of cinematic hip-hop stuff real big high energy um and then also they just pay the most so like ads ads are the like the cream of the crop when it comes to just licensing like um advertisement can go you know anywhere from low five figures up to high six figures you know what i mean depending on um, who you are, where you are. I feel like for any any artist, you'll probably get somewhere around like, um, I think I've seen maybe as high as like 500K for a song, you know what I mean? Uh, for indie artists or, or indie, I'll say 
some of them are like indie artists that are like maybe aligned with a like an indie publisher it's like an indie major publisher kind of thing so they do like court sometimes bigger placements and they can drive the, the price point up a little bit but um you know i've seen six figure placements you know for people without those type of arrangements but that's the space that i love um and also too oddly enough i like the micro sync space um even though they're probably the lower end of licensing it's just like some of the companies that I work with, like Musicbed is one of them. Um, they have such a subscriber base, and there's and the con the creator, the creator economy is just growing so much. And it's like it's, it's just not going to stop. So there's going to be more demand for it, and the more demand just means more opportunities for us to get our music license. And even though they can't pay, you know, at times like thousands of dollars for a single song, they might can afford somewhere between like, you know. 20 to you know 500 bucks or something like that or even lower you know what i mean but when you're getting a volume of them like a volume of micro licenses then it can be a really dope payoff because i've had like five figure months just off of you know uh micro stinks you know what i mean so uh so yeah it's, it's so weird i kind of like the opposite end of the spectrum ones that's probably my least favorite um is custom music and and this for me personally because i know some people kill it this just by doing custom stuff um and that's just and it's and it's for me i don't like it because i like to curate a catalog almost like um a product so the thing is if you're going into walmart like if if walmart got it you can buy it if it doesn't then you know you might have to go somewhere else kind of thing and so i like building up the inventory versus creating you know custom stuff all the time mainly because like if it's if I'm making something specifically for a kids theme show and it's talking about like we've had one where we're talking about like rice, <laughs> you know, he's like writing a song about rice and how rice looks in different countries, like or different you know parts of the world. And he's like, I'm never going to use this song anywhere else. <laughs> I mean, like outside of this particular context. Um, and so if you don't win it, then it's just like, you know you've you've invested a lot of time in something and, and typically like when you're doing customs they'll do like demo fees or kill fees just for your just for the attempt um they can be anywhere from like you know 200 to 500 bucks up to like a thousand or something like that depending on on the um the agency or the commission or whoever's commissioning it but yeah like at least as a strategy i just wanted to find like i wanted to be more proactive and just see what the market needed and to make something that felt a little bit more artist centric for me um and that's why i started to do more like just build them and curate my own catalog um but like i said like customs you can actually like we've i've made money you know off of customs as well so and some people just have a good knack for writing like really specific stuff like, i have some students i can hear like yo you would be really dope with customs you know what i mean because you just have a pen that lends itself to writing really specific and creating a story and um like through your words so yeah there's a guy i want to introduce to you and okay be able to put him on and guide him um his artist name is kibo but he made eighty two thousand dollars on fiverr just bro i okay. just saw his he did like a and csnbc or something like that like a little yeah i seen that joint <laughs> you have to drop a talk with him probably next week when going into deeper detail, that background, but that's custom songs, right? He's doing that. But based on what you're saying, I mean, just some of the demo fees will probably be even more than he's getting for some of the custom songs. And then the opportunity to make even more, right? So you just yeah. understand a lot deeper in the game I'm, based on a conversation I had with him. He's not in that world at all. It's just a yeah. Has this skill and he can do it quick and specific. So I think he could like run it up. He just needs to, the yeah. Guy. So, so yeah, 1, make an opportunity there for real mm -hmm. for somebody like that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And if he's already doing it, the skill set's there. Um, and it's one of those things. And also, too, if he has a good catalog, because we had another, um, well, a good a colleague friend of mine, she owns a company and they're underneath Quincy Jones Productions, but she was uh, one of our special guest speakers and she was mentioning that um because one of the students was actually like how do i break into that space if like to showcase custom mu music you kind of have to get custom jobs 
but in order to get custom jobs, you kind of have to have, you know, custom music showcase. Um, and so she was just saying like, you know, just being creative and maybe uh, doing mock uh, custom songs for different brands or whatever, just to showcase what you can do. But for him, since he's already doing it and actual client work, you know, it just might be a good showcase, you know, if he's pitching and looking to, to talk to other um, companies that, you know, do a lot of, you know, just custom work. It's like, hey, this is, you know, you know, my portfolio, what I can do. I would love to, you know, work with you if any any capacity. So so though yeah, he has like a uh pretty crazy catalog because he was like YouTubers, like, you know, he would just be doing the work, but then he'll find out that it was somebody big or whatever, like a YouTuber. <laughs> right. Oh man, like, I didn't know because you know, I get it, right? You know, We've all heard this type of thing in the music industry, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to run it up, right? Da, da, da. You're like, all right, whatever, because it could never happen, right? Someone makes a promise that it never happens. He's like, oh, man, this person wasn't lying. They really were big, or this was, really was um, a, a, a dope situation, which actually makes me think of one other thing from um, the talk with him that I want to know that it might have any type of work in your space uh, or potential risk in your space. So he did one of those spots for somebody <laughs> oh man, just thinking back to it he did a, a job for somebody and again you're not you're not looking at everybody who's involved you're just doing the work executing and it ends up being this third party this is during trump versus hillary mm-hmm. and it was like a third party, right he wrote the song or whatever and then they asked him to do a video he actually did the video he was like man i wasn't in i didn't even necessarily believe i was just trying to make the money right and i didn't <laughs> And he didn't know that they had clout or anything like that. He didn't really think it was going to see the light of day. Right. He had an interesting moment where his dad hit him up like, yo, bro, what's up? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> you believe X, Y, and Z? And I'm like, so yeah. have you ever seen or come across moments in like in music supervision where it might not be writing a song or specifically or even being in a video specifically where there's things that are out of alignment with values like i know you came out of the christian hip-hop space right like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Get navigated yeah so i mean that's not not a thing i mean it is and you know people just have different uh expectations and desires of where and how their music is being represented um and those are things that if you're working with like an agency partner who's pitching your music, you can make that um, clear and clear of, of if you know ahead of time the types of placements you would prefer not to you know be a part of having music associated with. Um, also, within their agreement, sometimes they have uh, like a, a, a clause or something like that that says they need uh, to get your approvals for like any political stuff or any tobacco use or any like, you know, taboo things or I'll say taboo things, but just, you know, sensitive things to certain certain groups of people. Um, they they'll include those. And I'm sure you can um, you know, do an inclusion or just let them know. Um, and or just be really upfront to say, like, hey, can I have approvals for the types of licenses that come through before we give a, a final yes to make sure? Cause typically when you're getting a, a license request, like studios or supervisors or, or, or creative directors or whoever is, you know, managing a pro- project when they're sending out briefs or requests for music, they're putting like scene descriptions and you'll kind of know the type of show it is. So like, you know, if it's like a P Valley type show and you just know a rip, like, you know, my, you know, it might not be the best look for me um, as a Christian hip hop artist that my song on a P Valley track, you know what I mean? No, you know, no shade or no judgment or anything. It's just, that just might be a real conversation. And so you have to, um in arrangements you can be up front and vocal to say like um either these type placements I, I like to avoid or can there just be approval that, you know, like can I have final approval on the type of placements that we have before we just go ahead and instantiate it um but that's a real thing I can't think of any placements that I've had um that we've rejected um uh, because we've had I mean I've had like pictures for like um like Maker's Mark, you know what I mean? Um, I'm trying to think. There was a, actually on the Your Honor, the Your Honor show uh, with Brian Cranston. I think it's a Showtime joint. But there was like, they used one of our songs for a scene where like this kid was like getting tortured or something like that, like in a basement or whatever. And so 
like for me, I, I look at our music as um, is a bit of like a character, you know, what I mean, to kind of tell the story of the show. And so like and I'm sure there's probably some things I'll end up running against where it's like, yeah, I don't know if I'll, you know, I rock with that. But for the most part, I try to think of our music in service of the story that's trying to be told um, and just, you know, play context for that versus uh, a statement about my value alignment to a degree, but that's more nuanced. We can get, you can go deeper into that, but that's just like the, the psychology or the philosophy around how you can navigate through it. Got you. Do you know any artists that have blown up off of syncs or you would consider that? Cause I know, I can't remember the lady Kate or something like that. Kate Bush or something. I Kate can't Bush. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or stranger things. She was already big at one period of time. Right. And right. Heard, I'm not sure if this is factual, that there was a placement that played a big part of creating Spark for Lizzo at one point in yeah. time. So what was yeah. that? If, if, you, if it was true, you would know about it. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I've, I've heard that as well. Like, she was heavy into licensing her music um, and just kind of use, use that as leverage and curated her own artist sound and stuff like that. And it's so funny because it, it probably makes sense why her music sounds so ad friendly. Like if you really kind of study music that's work for that's working for ads and you listen to how Lizzo stuff is set up, because it's I mean, she talks about feeling good, like it's a brand new day. She's unique, yeah. like it's real big, it's high energy, it's a lot of brass running, like all that stuff, like ads eat up, you know what I mean? Um, and it's also female empowerment. Like she's hella big on female empowerment. And that that's a big theme that gets requested a lot. Um, so it's one of those things, if she wasn't, then it would make a lot of sense. Um, or she, if she wasn't, then she's doing something she is not aware of. But if she is, and it makes a lot of sense looking at her music now. Um, but I'm trying to think of some other artists that kind of got a jump. Start. I mean, there's some other artists who are really... Um, who, who who really created a strong artist career, um, but they're they're not as big as a Lizzo like um, like Easy McCoy or like um, The Siege was one of them. Uh, they got really big audience base and like listenership off of licensing their music. Uh, Bo Williams is another one. He's like you know performed at I think he performing at um, what is it the um, is it the Thunder or the Lightning? I can't remember the the hockey team that's out in Tampa, but he's um a face for that like he'll go out and perform there and he has his, he's had his music used for um what is it like the bucks i think um for one of their campaigns and so he's started to curate even more of an artist identity um yeah and i i just know it's powerful just for awareness in general like the um i mean she's already popping but it just i guess a good little case in point because um Dochi uh, with TDE, she came out with her song Crazy, um, which was already, I think, doing some numbers and, and got buzzed. But I just saw it like I was literally in a conversation earlier. I was in a John Wick 3 uh, or no, John Wick 4. I was watching uh, a couple of weeks ago and seeing the trailers run. Literally, like in the span of three trailers, I heard her song twice. So she was in like this. It was a, um, I forget the, the name of the movie, but it, it had like a um, Indian cast of female leads in martial arts type stuff. Um, and they were using this trailerized version of Dochi's track, uh, Crazy. And then there was a trailer that ran in between it. And then there was another one that was um, a predominantly Asian cast, um, female driven, uh, Kind of high energy, high energy, and they were both kind of comedic, you know, com comedic flavors of, of movies or trailers. Um, but they were using a, a, t a different version of Do a Dochi's track that was trailerized. You know what I mean? And so, again, it's just it, it creates even more exposure for that track because I don't know where the life line of that song has been since they released. Because typically, when you put out a song, like unless you just got some crazy marketing, like it's just it's just on a, a downward trend as far as listenership. Um, but I'd imagine like that type of, uh, insertion of, or injection of like putting this into a, you know, a new trailer can, you know, drive up awareness again and get Do Dochi, you know, even more of a fan base. 
um, outside of what she's already done because she's super dope. She already has a fan base, but you know, if, if it can work in that sense for Dochi, it can work for you know an indie artist. You know what I mean? Because it's the same the same uh, strategies are are true. You know what I mean? It's just different people insert different artists. Do you ever plan your your marketing campaigns for your songs around? Like certain drop dates for placements, like oh, you looking like yo, this movie comes out on the thirteenth, right? Or doing certain things to lead up to it. Do, do you work it that way? You know, um, I think I would like to do that more. I don't, um, not or it, it just I don't even know if it's I don't. Is that sometimes I just don't have the opportunity to. Um, a lot of times, my music is either already out and they're you know it's just already being worked and it just works for a spot um but that is a, a strategy that people do if they know ahead of time and supervisors sometimes will like like they'll um either at times want to align with an artist that is you know up and coming or whatever and try to uh plan a release or, or I'm not even like the show probably gonna coming out when it come out it doesn't matter but they'll let them know ahead of time like hey this song is coming out um or excuse me this show is coming out you know on this date you know, probably be good to, you know, definitely make sure your music is out around that time or you just kind of leverage the news of this song uh, or the show releasing and your song being in it as a campaign boost. But um, but yeah, I haven't done it as much as I would like to, but it is a strategy that's helpful and it works. And sometimes brands will not only notify you, but they'll want to partner with you and even maybe do some exposure around the artists that they're working with, depending on the type of spot it is. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. like a pop up or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why, too, like, I, I talk about licensing from the aspect of, like, if you are just a, a artist producer and somewhere in obscurity, you don't even have a social following, you ain't doing no numbers, and that, like, sync is for, like, it's still for you. You know what I mean? You can still make a healthy living off of licensing your music without all the other metrics. But it also is very helpful. You know, you use every tool at your disposal to, you know, garner attention, awareness, and scale your, your business. But, like, having fans having streams you know obviously helps you know it gives you more leverage and so i've seen you know briefs come through now where they're looking for up-and-coming artists to align with and there's a story there to help project like when we was at south by southwest um i was listening to a, a panel about uh music and and games like music for games so they had like uh as you do named dk over like the 2k um kind of franchise and all the music there they had somebody from microsoft talking somebody from soundcloud and another rep uh from uh they do a lot of web3 stuff with dead mouse and so they're coming up their own platform and they were talking about how like um sometimes they are like they're looking on um actually uh, soundcloud did a a partnership with 2K at one point to try to align themselves with like upcoming artists. And so they're looking, trying to see their story. There was, I forget the name of the artist, but it was one, um, one of the, the littles, you know, like one of those little, you know, little rappers. They uh, saw like they were, you know, heavy on SoundCloud. They may not have the type of base they do now, but they were heavy on like gaming and stuff like that. And they would be on online, like freestyling or battling their friends or whatever. And I think, I think it was Microsoft that kind of caught wind of it and did a partnership with them where they were and it ended up really accelerating, you know, that particular artist's career. I can't remember their names, but um, so that's why I say like, you can leverage your existing artist platform as well um, to your advantage with licensing. It's just an additive, but it's not a prerequisite. You feel me? Yeah. So now the the thing you touched on earlier with Liz, I want to go back to her before we get out of here. Yeah. You made it sound like there is a formula of sorts that you can build your music out for, right? You say Lizzo wrote a lot of women empowerment things, right? The the way the sonics work, they work great for commercials. Uh, can you tell me more about what that strategy might look like? Because I'm sure there's different ways, but let's just say uh, if I'm Lizzo, all right, or or somebody in that bag, what are they probably doing? Um, in in terms of saying these are the type of songs I, or commercials I want to have, um, these are the type of trailers I want to get in. What are they building for? How yeah. You- yeah. So I think for Lizzo now, she probably 
you know, doesn't prioritize it in the same way she used to. Um, she did because now she's she's just larger than, you know, than, than life in a sense. Like her brand is so polarizing now. She can kind of create what she wants without having to prioritize a, um, a brand placement, so to say, or at least in the same way she was. Now for like any artist, it's for us to like I always like one of the things I always tell my students is that when you're like positioning yourself to start licensing um, and to and to court more licenses more frequently, like you have to adopt the mindset that you're writing music for brands, not just for fans. And so effectively, the brands become your fans because they're the ones who are actually finding the utility for your music. Like currently, as it, you know, as an artist, your fans are the ones who are the greatest consumers of your music. And so it serves you to try to understand them and create music that they're going to rock to, that you align with, all that kind of stuff. Um, when it comes to working for brands, like they have particular needs that they're looking for because they're trying to either tell a story or sell a product. And so your music has to support that. And it's not the start of show. You know what I mean? So you really have to try to like uh, empathize and understand like, if, if I'm looking to get into a Nike, you know what I mean? Like, well, like do some market research. You're like, well, what type of, of, like what type of visual content is Nike putting out? And based on the segments of, of content they're putting out, cause they might have some um, like editorial stuff or just some, you know, commercial stuff or, um, you know, brand partnerships that, you know, they align their music a little different. Like what, what are the different segments of, of type of visual media that Nike makes? And what music is are they actually leaning to? Because Nike can go anywhere from very emotive, you know, theatrical score driven stuff that's like, you know, the black and white, um, very uh, heartfelt, like overcoming, you know, motivational type pieces. But they can also do a high energy like sports thing. You know, what I mean, so it's just kind of understanding, seeing the rhythms and what they've used in the past because typically it can be a good indication of what they need you know moving forward as well and because brands like kind of pay attention to other brands if i make a song with nike in mind like it's not uncommon for an adidas to like maybe want something that's similar to that or a new balance or whatever, or even just like an energy drink company, because they all to some degree kind of like live in the same, um, not industry, but you, you kind of get what I'm saying. Like they're, I think they're just influenced. They just, they just feel familiar. So that's why it's really good to just start looking to say like, what are the, the, the types of placements I would like to court? Um, if it's more sports driven stuff, um, uh, let me just start studying and seeing like, like what's there. Um, and that becomes a good uh, launching point to say, all right, can I make a song that would live on a playlist of these types of songs that I'm hearing? You know what I mean? Like if I can make a song that's inspired or influenced by this type vibe, and if I had it on the playlist and I'm skipping from track to track, my, my minds would flow right, you know, in line with it. Like that's where you start to kind of reverse engineer and start having more more sustainable success because you are prioritizing and empathizing with what brands actually are, are needing and using. And it's a lot easier because it's so public and it's entertainment. And so you can just go Google something or go watch TV and like you're you're getting education right then and there. You know what I mean? Versus having to go like, where do I look to see what music's being used? Well, just go watch TV, you know what I mean? Or go, go watch a commercial. Um, and same thing for different segments, like what what makes up a trailer when I go sit in and there for the, that first 15 minutes, I'm like, I want to get there early so I can see like what type of music are you using? Like, what are the genres that I'm hearing? Like and in that particular movie, um, like do, like what genre do they use? How do they use it? Um, and then even comparing that to other similar type movies and stuff. So it just becomes a big research uh, project, which is like it's mad fun, you know what I mean? Cause I get to watch some entertaining and learn and then go create the music that could essentially fit for it. So um, that's what I would advise as far as just trying to study and prep and figure out how to make the music that brands actually need, go listen to what brands are actually using now and then use it as a, as a starting point when you're creating your own. So, so. Yeah. Yeah. man, well, ending it there, man, I'm, 
appreciate all of the game and knowledge that you brought to the table in this talk. Um, like you got to give them somewhere to follow you. We'll put your name up, you know, <laughs> and of course. But yeah, where is the best place to keep up with you right now? Yeah, I'll make it easy and just go follow me um, at Just the Raj, and that's J U S T D E R A J on IG. That's my most active platform. Um, you know, if you're interested in you know getting your music into TV and film and learning how to license it yourself, um, just shoot me a DM and me and my team will get back to you. Um, we can tell you kind of some about some of the other um, offers that we have or just ways that we might be able to help and point you in the right direction. Um, one thing I did mention in you know, my company, uh, seeing here, we also do some song representation. Uh, we're a, a, a boutique uh, agency, I like to call it, or a music house. So we don't take on a lot, but you know, we do listen to all the submissions that come through, at least at this point, until we get too much of demand and we might have to figure out another strategy. But um, and that that was birthed out of you know us trying to find more opportunities for independent artists to get their music in TV and film um, outside of education, also like actually providing you know uh, those opportunities. But um, but again, we run lean and we curate you know pretty heavily. So uh, feel free to send some stuff out there. But um, but I, I encourage. I encourage I encourage knowledge over anything because I feel like as an indie artist, learning how to understand like understand how to get your music in its TV and film and what this business is makes you way more um autonomous versus always having to go through somebody and middleman a deal for you. Um so yeah, you can follow me there and keep up with us and all the new stuff we got coming out. So dope, dope. Hey everybody, you just tuned in to yet another episode of No Labels Necessary featuring Daraj. I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace. Let's go.